Cherry Creek High School looked like any other sprawling suburban campus, full of blissfully unaware teens absorbed in the drama of classes, clubs, and social hierarchies. At the apex of the school's complex inner world was Emily Hayes, the universally beloved senior class president and homecoming queen two years running. Her flawless blonde hair and radiant smile made her seem almost angelic. Her charitable events and community outreach efforts only added to her saintly persona. Teachers and peers alike gushed about her selfless spirit and kindness. Emily was the idol of Cherry Creek, enjoying the adoration and envy of all, or so it seemed on the surface. In truth, Emily's popularity was a carefully constructed house of cards, built on exaggerations and outright lies. The coat drives and food pantries she organized were totally fictitious events, existing only in forged posters taped to the walls. Her tragic stories of childhood hardship, from poverty to family loss, were fables spun to garner sympathy. Even her pristine academic record of straight A's was fabricated, with altered transcripts and cheating allowing her to maintain the ruse. Emily's deceit ran deep, though only she knew the truth behind the facade. Her inner circle considered her a close friend, hanging on her every word, unaware that even her family background was a sham. Not broken and penniless as claimed, but comfortably middle class with two loving parents. Emily repeated her lies with such conviction that her words wove a spell over the student body. Behind her sweet smile, she felt occasional pangs of guilt, but the validation and status that came with her popularity overshadowed any reservations. That is, until Alex Price transferred to Cherry Creek their senior year. Alex saw through the cracks in Emily's stories from day one, immediately questioning her so-called volunteer projects and family sob stories. Their English teacher, Mrs. Taylor, paired Alex and Emily together for an assignment, and Alex seized the opportunity to scrutinize Emily, pointing out inconsistencies in her tales. Emily, feeling threatened by Alex's skepticism, responded by spinning even more elaborate lies. She talked about organizing an elaborate charity masquerade ball for hospital patients, complete with live music, catering, and extravagant costumes. She whispered that her uncle, who ran a major charity organization downtown, would be speaking and donating. As Alex called out more holes, Emily patched them with dramatic new details, like her parents' impending divorce and bankruptcy. With each fabrication, she dug herself deeper. Oblivious to the brewing storm, Emily's inner circle encouraged her charity ball plans and consoled her over the family drama. Cheryl, Emily's closest friend, took a lead role, promising to help decorate and distribute invitations school-wide. David, who long nursed a crush on Emily, asked her to be his date for the big night. As Emily spun lies to her friends, she spent her free period in the journalism room, developing an unlikely but genuine friendship with Sam Rivers, a shy junior who wrote for the school paper. Sam saw flashes of Emily's true self beneath the polished veneer, her wit, insight, and vulnerability. While Emily kept up the illusions for everyone else in stolen moments with Sam, she could be real. Sam hoped she might convince Emily to come clean, to stop living a lie, but it was too late. Emily was in too deep. The day before winter break, Emily announced the charity ball would take place the first Saturday night back much to the delight of the student body. A local newspaper even caught wind, wanting to do a feature on Emily's initiative. Pressure mounted, but Emily couldn't back out now without her web collapsing. She convinced herself she could fake it till she made it through the night. But Alex, tired of the deceptions, took action. Two days before the ball, Alex leaked suspicions about Emily's behavior and evidence of faked transcripts to the principal. Soon rumors swirled, and the local paper threatened to rescind their coverage if something seemed amiss. Cornered, Emily broke down and confessed tearfully to Cheryl and David that she'd fabricated it all. The ball, the charity, the family troubles. On the night the event was supposed to happen, the truth spilled out in a public spectacle on the steps of the school gym, with Cheryl and David confronting her as students looked on in disbelief, their illusions shattered. Emily fled down the steps in her gown, mascara stained, her empire in ruins. Students turned on her, the sycophants now jeering how stupid she looked. Even teachers distanced themselves, claiming no knowledge of her deceptions. Only Sam stood by Emily in the aftermath, finding her crumpled outside the school entrance, her flawless veneer washed away. But their friendship fractured too, unable to withstand the weight of betrayal. Emily became a pariah, 
retreating from school in shame, unable to face the hostile glares and icy isolation that now greeted her in the halls she once ruled. At home, her phone vibrated with a text from an unknown number. Saw the gym caught fire after your charity scam was exposed. So tragic. Three students dead. Emily read it twice, confused why someone would invent something so awful. But the texts kept coming, each referencing increasingly disturbing outcomes of events she'd lied about in the past. One said a relationship she claimed ended in brutal murder. Another described a horrific accident on a trip she'd fabricated. The darkest messages referenced family secrets she'd hinted at sparking suicide attempts. With each message, her elaborate stories over the years were woven into twisted new tragedies, echoing unsettlingly with real people and events. Emily tried to ignore it as a mean prank, blocking the numbers, but more unknown contacts flooded in. She changed her number only for the texts to appear on her new one within hours. She deleted social media, but the anonymous harassment followed her from platform to platform. At school, an atmosphere of unease festered in the wake of her lies. Students jumped at shadows in empty hallways and spoke in anxious whispers about strange incidents mirroring details from the unnerving texts. A freshman girl was pushed violently down the stairs, fracturing her collarbone and wrist, just as a message described. The newspaper office flooded from a burst pipe, ruining the equipment and archives, an eerie parallel to a described plumbing failure that destroyed cherished memories. Emily felt watched constantly by some unseen force that lingered just out of view, humming with subtle menace. When she walked the halls, the fluorescent lights flickered and dimmed around her. Classmates fell silent when she entered a room, their eyes tracing her with icy contempt that hinted at something darker. She pulled Sam aside after class one day, pleading for him to admit he was behind the texts, though her gut knew he wasn't. His eyes reflected genuine fear, not malice. Something sinister had invaded their school, something that fed off the toxicity in the air, that breathed subtle life into her destructive lies and preyed upon the fragmented trust. A week later, Emily's phone lit up past midnight with a chilling message. I will show you the truth if you come to the gym at midnight. Come alone. Against every instinct, Emily crept across the empty campus an hour later, mist hanging low along the paths. She found the gym door unlocked and slipped into the dark, cavernous space. In the dim glow of the emergency lights, she could make out the gym floor decorated for the ball she had only ever imagined. Streamers, tables, chairs, Spectral figures in gowns and suits silently danced and mingled, their features blurred like mist. Emily froze, heart hammering against her ribs. As the spectral students turned toward her, Emily's blood turned to ice in her veins. Their eyes were lifeless voids, their mouths shaping unheard words. The clock struck midnight, and the truth crashed over her. The school was now stained by her lies haunted by the stories she had crafted within its walls. Each apparition represented a thread of deception she'd spun, given form by some dark force that now held the campus in its grip. Emily collapsed to her knees on the polished wood floor, shouting tearful apologies and confessions to the ghosts summoned up by her years of fabricated stories and sculpted personas. But the apparitions only stared, condemned to relive silently the moment she had authored. By dawn, as the winter sunlight spilled across the bleachers and playing fields, Emily had fallen silent, blank eyes staring into nothingness. Her voice faded to a tremulous whisper among the others that still stirred restlessly in the corners and shadows. Some say if you listen close enough in the empty corridors or changing rooms, you can still hear her muted screams begging forgiveness, warning others not to make the same mistakes. Sometimes students who find themselves alone in the halls feel cold fingers graze their shoulders and spin around to catch a glimpse of her face before it fades. The ghost of the girl who lied herself and others into oblivion.